trying to destroy now for three generations. Nobody is better off in a system of fake diversity or preaching phantom white privilege or whining about trigger warnings or being offended by microaggressions or retreating to fake safe spaces that don't really exist in the real world. We are all better off when we embrace fundamentally good values, when we share values of responsibility and decency together. So what are some of those common fundamental values we should be teaching? Let's start with the ones embodied in the Constitution, freedom of speech, of religion, of the press, of assembly and petition, and let's add in some basic civic values. Don't have babies without being married. Don't engage in crime. Don't do violence to people who disagree with you. If we're all better to one another, not in terms of being oversensitive or worrying we're all going to offend one another, but in assuming that we probably will at some point offend one another from time to time, and that's okay. We can live together. You don't have to care what I think. I don't have to care what you think. That's the wonderful thing about America. That doesn't mean we should go around insulting everybody, but it does mean we have to respect facts as facts and opinions as opinions and insults as insults, and they're not all the same thing. And then we, we don't have to shut down debate. We don't have to strong arm protesters and destroy the country in order to make ourselves feel good. We can actually feel good about what we share together. A constitutional system that prizes individual liberty and individual responsibility, a simple goodness that agrees to disagree about what we do in our own lives, but agrees generally that being a mensch, being a decent human being, is required of everybody. We share not our own truths, this phrase, my truth, there's no such thing as your truth, there's just the truth and then there's your opinion. We don't share our own truths, but actual factual truths and actual standards. We're all in this together and we're all gonna have to share a country, so let's stop letting the fascist left separate us with buzzwords and tyranny of subjective feelings. If we do that, then finally we'll be able to build what the founders foresaw and what Martin Luther King dreamed of and what generations fought and bled and died to achieve. A society of values rather than races, of commonality rather than polarization, and of truth rather than lies. Thanks so much, happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thanks so much. All righty. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. All right, we're going to... Okay, so we're going to take, take some, some questions. Yeah. And uh, my, my only rule, you, you guys will handle the questioning, but my, my rule is if you're left, you get to go first because it's, it's more interesting and more fun. <laughs> Do you dare? Hi. Hey, how's it going? Is this on? Okay. Why are you doing this? Is it for fame? I don't understand. This being... <laughs> I'm asking, why do you give these lectures and say these things? Is it because it's going to make you more famous? No. If I wanted to be more famous, then I'd, I'd write a TV show and take off my pants. I mean, it, 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 <laughs> no, the, the, the purpose of giving these lectures is to speak basic truths to generally crowds of people who either disagree with those basic truths. I, I encourage more, more, more leftists to come to my lectures and also to arm people who believe in truth with facts that they can use to combat lies. That's the purpose of the lectures. Also, I get paid. <laughs> What's going on, Ben? Love your program, love all that stuff. Oh, thank you, I appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, I think as kind of a, a millennial conservative, constitutional conservative, one of the biggest threats and one of the hardest things to respond to from people on the left is when they talk about the utopia of the Nordic countries because they are mm -hmm. oftentimes armed with a lot of facts in regards to the efficiency of their public programs and things to that effect. So how would you recommend responding to those claims of, of the utopianism of, of the Nordic countries? Okay, so the first thing that's important to notice about the Nordic countries is that the Nordic countries are by and large extraordinarily ethnically homogenous. So they're not comparable uh, in terms of the, in terms of, and culturally homogenous as well. Uh, so Vermont looks a lot like Norway. Right, Bernie Sanders' philosophy works in Vermont and it works in Norway, but it only works for a temporary period of time because Vermont doesn't have its own defense budget and really neither does Norway, right? We've been paying for the Nordic countries' defense budgets for a long time. Also, it's worthwhile noting 
that the taxes in these countries are extraordinarily high, and the countries are going bankrupt anyway. So for about a 15-year period, 20-year period, the Nordic countries have been experiencing extraordinarily slow growth, which has led them to actually elect more right-wing governments on economics and deregulate their economies, because it turns out people don't like paying twice the amount that it costs for a normal car. Right? The, the, the income tax rate in, in places like Denmark for middle-class people, not for upper-class people, for middle-class people is like 60%. So you know, it's easy for, for students to say 60% sounds good, but you all go to Yale, which means that eventually you'll have a job that pays you enough that you'll be paying a high percentage of your income in taxes and it ain't that much fun. There's a reason that Denmark, all these countries are now turning away from this, and uh, they've been living off the back of America paying for their defense budget for a very long time. So you have the privilege of, of not having to pay your own defense budget. You also have a, a group of what can best be described as middle of upper education people who have grown up in Western countries with a particular set of values and socialism, in, at least in the, in the Nordic way, not, not full government ownership of resources, but, but high redistribution of income, you know, that is, is capable of lasting for a certain period of time, but even there it collapses. Hi, Ben. So Howdy. unconscious bias is a concept well documented in psychological studies, which is basically that people associate negative things with people of color and positive things with whites. So if that is true, how does it, given that that is true, how does white privilege not exist? Okay, so um, you're asking about unconscious bias. I apologize because it's kind of echoey, but, but the, uh, the question was, if there is unconscious bias, just to repeat it so I'm making sure I get it right, if given there is unconscious bias, moment, how does white privilege not exist? The question is, given that there is unconscious bias, how does white privilege not so, exist? Uh, so, okay, so number one, so when I speak about white privilege, yes, yeah, so when I speak about white privilege, I'm speaking specifically about behavior. Okay, there have been no studies and really, I've looked at these studies. The, the, the connection between what they call implicit bias, this is their, their favorite phrase now, implicit bias, unconscious bias, and biased behavior has yet to be proven at any level that is even remotely necessary to be used in, for example, a courtroom, which is why it's never been used in a courtroom. It is also true that there is no way, there, there really isn't, there's been no proven way to alleviate what they call unconscious bias, which means that we're ghost hunting. So what I would suggest is that if there is unconscious bias, and I'll acknowledge the possibility or the reality of unconscious bias, if there is, then I need you to put, I don't care about what's in people's heads so much as what they do. So if you point me to an, a racist behavior, I'm, uh, don't worry, I'll, I'll, let, you, I'll let you respond. Uh, if, 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 I, if you point me to a racist behavior, I'm happy to stand alongside you and protest it. What I can't do is protest about things in people's head that I don't know about because I'm not a mind reader. Okay, so that's a really interesting response. And to that, I have two questions. Firstly, what I've heard you say that this is something that, you know, the way people think doesn't affect their behavior. So that, that's the first thing you've said. So I'm really curious if you can kind of give me another example of a thought that somebody has which doesn't affect their behavior. Like, do people who, you know, support Trump not vote for him? Like, I'm very curious about that. Yes. And secondly, okay, okay, that was, okay. So mm -hmm. the second thing that I want to ask is that if it's something that's it's hard to fix, does it mean we shouldn't do anything about it? Because you said, oh, I don't know if we can change how people think. Does that mean we shouldn't try? I mean, first of all, not a great impression. But beyond that, uh, <laughs> but, my voice isn't that low. Um, but, but, beyond, but beyond that, um, as far as the, the first question, which is do people have thoughts that, they, that, that don't manifest in behavior, yes, all the time. For instance? For instance, every thought that you have about walking up here and strangling me right now. I mean, I assume, I I mean, I assume like, we, we have thoughts all the time that don't manifest in behavior, and this is true every single day. We consider thoughts that, that cross our minds. And the problem with unconscious bias is the idea is you don't even know that you're having the thought, right? So how can you stop it if you don't even know that you're having it? But then we should be able to gauge the unconscious bias and its impact on behavior. That's why it's unconscious bias as opposed to conscious bias. Right? The, the, the idea behind unconscious bias is that it's not even a ghost. It's a ghost of a ghost because you don't even know you're having the thought. So people, like... The, the, whole, the whole idea behind diversity training is just is, is the idea that you can retrain people to stop their chain of thought in order so that it doesn't manifest in behavior. I don't think that every thought manifests in behavior. If it did, then every time a man saw a good-looking woman walk down the street, a straight man saw a good-looking woman down the street, we'd have a real mess on our hands. So you know, the, the, the second question, the idea was, was a little too broad for me to respond to, which is just because something is tough, don't we have to face up to it? Yes, we have to face up to tough things all the time. And one of the tough things I would suggest that we face up to is that you have a lot more control over your own behavior and the decisions you make than the supposedly widespread unconscious bias of people you've never met. Hi. Hi. Um, 
So uh, you spoke a bit about the um, sort of um, the boost and the negation of the SAT scores that black applicants may receive with comparison to Asian people or in comparison to white Yeah, I people. spoke about Princeton study, correct. And you also spoke about um, like how there is not an equality of outcome in this nation. So with regard to this... No, no, there is inequality of outcome. Yeah, yeah. There's no inequality of opportunity, yes. Yes. In the sense that there's no government obstacles. There are, there, there are inequality, just to clarify before we finish the question, I promise, I'll let you finish. When I say there's no inequalities of opportunity, I obviously don't mean that we are all equally situated. I will never be an NBA basketball player. It's never going to happen. Although I could probably make the Lakers roster, they're that bad, but... <laughs> go ahead. Uh, given that you contend that there is an equality of opportunity in this nation, um, do you think it is right for the government to pursue, or like f for federal cases to say that um, in some cases policies like affirmative action targeting certain ethnic groups are correct, and g doing this, does it um, acknowledge white privilege, <coughs> or do we just should um, just leave this sort of policies totally out even though there is inequality of outcome? No. Uh, so my answer about affirmative action and government policies that are meant to rectify these inequalities of, of outcome, no, I'm very much opposed to those. If you have two people who, are, who have equal SAT scores and one of them happens to have had a bad childhood with obstacles to overcome and one happens to have grown up in, in a very rich household, then that's an actual factor that has to be taken into account. But if somebody gets an SAT score that's 200 points below somebody else and the only differentiating factor the only differentiating factor is their race. That's racism. I mean, there was a, there was, I remember a few years back, there was a story in the Wall Street Journal about a, an Asian kid who got like a 1510 on his SATs at, when it was out of 1600, and he grew up extremely poor, single mother, uh, had to, had to, it was a rough neighborhood, so he had to study in his closet for fear of gunshots and all this stuff. And he, didn't get, he applied to Yale, didn't get in, and he didn't get in because he was Asian. He, if he'd been black, he would have gotten in. I mean, that, that sort of stuff is just racism, pure and simple. I don't understand why a Colin Powell's kid is not worse off than that Asian kid was. And we're all differently situated, so let's look at each other as individuals. There's some black people who have it really bad in this country. There's some people, black people who have it really great in this country. There are a lot of white people who have it really bad in this country. There are more white people on food stamps than black people, by a large margin. There are more white people on welfare than black people, by a large margin. Which is not to suggest that black people are not on average poorer than white people, because they are. But we're going to be in a much better position to do justice when we stop focusing so much on the perversion that's known as social justice. Social justice stands in direct contravention and opposition to justice. Justice is about you take action, you get what you deserve. Social justice is about you take action, and we may or may not give you what you deserve based on what we think your social group deserves. And that's evil. That really is. I mean, the idea that, that we're going to not judge the individual, we're instead going to judge what is most apropos for society based on the group to which you belong, and in some cases to which we arbitrarily place you, that's actually, that's actually evil. That's the, the social justice is, is another word for, for redistribution of, of outcome and, uh, and unfairness. It, this, justice is a word that doesn't need a modifier. Like the word good doesn't need a modifier. Social justice doesn't need a modifier. You add social to it, you're detracting from the original word. Good evening, Mr. Shapiro. Thank you for coming down. Um, on basically the same topic, um, then how do you address the differences in like, for instance, the educational system uh, between inner city schools, which usually have you know, worse infrastructure, um, many times have lack qualified teachers or lack teachers, period, versus schools in affluent neighborhoods? How do you try to get justice uh, to, the stu to the students living in inner cities versus those living in uh, affluent neighborhoods. Right. Thanks. So, I mean, the, the answer to me is more individual freedom, not less. One of the one of the grave uh, one of the one of the great problems is that people think government action is what rectifies these these situations. It doesn't matter how much money you dump into inner city public schools, if number one, you don't have any sort of of community or family structure that supports education. And this isn't just true of black communities. It's true. There's a, J.D. Vance's Hillbilly Elegy is a really worthwhile book. You should read it. It's it's all about. Uh, a, a kind of downtrodden white communities in Ohio, and they have some, some similar problems to a lot of inner city black communities. The, the solution here is, is twofold. One, give parents more choice in where they send their kids to school. And two, a reversion to an actual belief in parental responsibility. Because the truth is that... The idea that, that kids are failing in the inner city because they just have bad teachers isn't true. I mean, if you've ever met the teachers in the inner city, some of them are wonderful. And some of them, they're really doing the best they can, I think. 
I think the, the, the bigger problem that you have is when you have broken families and you have, uh, and you have people who are not inculcating the value of education, and when you have people who are, who are saying to young people, and this is true all over the country regardless of race, and this is one of my problems with this election is I think all of the candidates in their own way are basically saying, you're a victim of the society, so individual responsibility no longer devolves to you. If you actually have parents saying to their own kids, okay, I expect you to do well. If I expect you to get an education. It's not, it's not a suggestion. It's an expectation that you're going to work hard. Then there really is, that's, that's the only way that this is ever going to get solved. It, it, parents are the one, I have my own kids. I'm, I'm the one, in the end, even if there are no, like, I'm not going to send my kid to public school. I'm going to send my kid to private schools because the public schools in my area are a failure. Uh, LAUSD spends about $10,000 per student per year, and it's the worst school district in America. Uh, I'm going to send my kids to private school, but even if there were no private schools available, my job is educating my kids just like my job is feeding my kids. My job is to take care of my kids. If I do nothing else in my life, taking care of my kids is my sole responsibility, and people who fail to recognize this... <laughs> You want to talk about what's the number one problem in America. That's the number one problem in America, is people running away from their responsibility to their kids and to their family members and to their parents. If we all took care of our kids and our family members and our parents, there wouldn't be any need for the government to come in and screw everything up royally like it does. Yeah. Hi, Ben. Um, I'm not a Yale student, uh, but I'm down here because I was interested in the presentation. Um, the question I have is related to affirmative action, and it's uh, a topic that I don't think is discussed often. And the topic is such that, you know, me seeing affirmative action at universities and in the workplace, I work for the state of Connecticut where we have an affirmative action department, and some of the hiring is based upon race. And the thing I don't hear discussed is basically the downside of this being that, you know, for myself, anytime I'm looking at people maybe applying for jobs or getting things or me selecting a physician or a lawyer or something, this question is coming to my mind, and I don't think it's fair for me to have this in my mind, but it's like, well, are they where they are because of some policy like affirmative action? Is that how they got to be where they were, or are they really qualified, whether it's a pilot, a lawyer, or anything like that? And this is a thing I think a lot of people have in their minds is they're not sure nowadays if people are getting where they are because they got some you know, privilege because of their race, or they really worked for it. And you know, that's something in the back of my mind and other people I talk to, and I wanted your opinion on that. Well, I mean, I, th I think obviously that's true. I mean, if, if, if there are programs that benefit a particular group of people at the expense of another group of people, people are going to wonder whether the beneficiary group got there through merit or whether they got through because of a specific program. I mean, that's just normal human response. Uh, you know, does that mean that the person actually got there? Not because of merit? Of course not, and that's not what you're saying. Um, but, there, but that question is an open question. I mean, obviously, if you know that some people in a particular group got five points extra on a test, you don't know which, five, which of those people got five points extra on the test. I'll also say that affirmative action, which I'm against all the way across the board, it, it, becomes, particularly, it becomes particularly counterproductive in the realm of public sector contracts. When you're talking about the government hiring people or lo with, with lower standards because of, the, the, because of their race, uh, I don't care what the race is of the fireman who saves me. I just care that he's able to carry my fat rear out the back door. And, uh, and you know, I think that the, the government shouldn't be in the business of trying to rectify all of history's injustices. The government should be in the business of trying to find the best people for the job since I'm a taxpayer and I pay those people salary. Thank you. Um, one thing that you didn't talk that much about was multiculturalism. So I saw a wonderful video that you did on radical Islam. And I'm curious uh, how we address uh, when different cultures might actually have radically different values. How yes. do we start to have that conversation? Well, I mean, the first thing you have to do is be honest about that. I mean, this idea, and, and it's promulgated by right, left, and center, that, that everybody down deep has the same values. I mean, it's in, the, it's in the Declaration of Independence, the idea that these truths are self-evident. I mean, sorry to break it to everybody, the truths are not self-evident. If they were self-evident, then everybody would have them. Right? If they were self-evident, every country would have a declaration of independence. They're an outgrowth of a specific Judeo-Christian culture that grew into an enlightenment, which grew into the declaration of independence. The idea that everyone around the world wants the same thing is actually significantly disrespectful to people from different cultures who have different priorities and believe different things. When I say disrespectful, I don't mean that their cultures are great. I think a lot of cultures out there are absolute horse crap. But that doesn't... But it is true, of course, that people have different priorities and different cultures and different belief systems. 
I mean, there's a, I, I was speaking with, uh, with one of my security guys, and he uh, was a former military guy, served in Iraq and Afghanistan. And he was saying one of his buddies uh, had a situation where he, uh, where he was, was raiding an Afghani weapons cache, and he walked in, there's a seven-year-old with an AK. Okay, that's, 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 a, that's a result of, of a culture that does not value children in the same way that Western culture values children. And Western culture didn't always value children the way the Western culture now values children, which is why people used to have 10 kids and five of them would die and then you'd have more kids, right? The, the, they didn't even used to name kids for the first couple of months in many Western cultures. So culture shifts over time uh, and, uh, and it's important to recognize these differences in culture because you have to know what the obstacles are and the differences are before you can actually come to an agreement about what can change and what can't be changed. It's a little bit of a world-beating notion that you can walk into Iraq and magically change it into a Western democracy, as George W. Bush found out. Um, and, it's also, and it's also a bit of foolishness on the part of the left that any person from any culture is necessarily going to hold the same values that we are. Uh, you know, when, when people say, you know, everybody loves their children, well, it's hard for me to say everybody loves their children when I see pictures of a Hamas terrorist strapping a, a suicide bomb on a three-year-old. I, I don't think that that person loves his child. I think I like his child more than he does, probably. Uh, we just have time for a couple more, so. How's it going, Ben? Um, I have a question, kind of a legal question that's in the news lately. Colin Kaepernick doesn't want to stand for the national anthem. Uh -huh. And uh, I'd like to bring ESPN fired Kurt Schilling for having different opinions that they wanted to promote. Yes. Can the NFL, Roger Goodell, technically uh, just get rid of Colin Kaepernick from... I mean, I don't know. I don't know how the contractual situation works between the NFL and the teams. Whether he can, he, whether he can. I mean, I suppose he could suspend him or, or fire him for conduct detrimental to the league. It's a private organization; it can do what it wants. ESPN can fire Kurt Schilling. You know, you may disagree with their decision to fire Kurt Schilling. I did, but I think that, that the idea that that the NFL is somehow barred from from doing that is silly. Now, do I think the NFL should get rid of of Colin Kaepernick? No, I, I don't, actually. I think, that, I think that Colin Kaepernick should be allowed to do that, and people should be allowed to boo him and root against him and hope that he gets sacked every time he gets on the field. I think that's, I think that's, that's probably the best solution. Hi. Um, I just have a couple of questions of clarification. So, sure. Um, you touched on it a little bit towards the end of your lecture, but if you could describe more, I guess, like elaborate more on what you mean by decency and, mm -hmm. and these, these fundamental values, especially in light of the statements that you just made in response to the question, not this last question, but before this, recognizing the fluidity of culture and cultural values and the existence of cultures that don't necessarily share the same values, and how, how do you account for that, moving towards a common set of values? How do you, if you believe that it is useful, develop coalition politics in order to move towards a collective sense of value? How do you reconcile individual motivation if you believe fundamentally? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of complexity here, but yes. Yeah, I mean, so uh, if you, I mean, like, if you, but honestly, I, I mean, so these not are high-stakes questions. Not to go all religious on you, but leaving aside the religious aspects of the Ten Commandments, I think that'd be a pretty good place to start with basic decency. Right, don't steal, don't. I, you know, I'm, I'm a deeply religious person. I'm an Orthodox Jew. I don't think that it's mandated that everybody believe in God, obviously, and I think that, you know, and I understand the arguments for atheism. That, that said, I think that you know basic values that we all that we in Western civilization tend to share are things like you don't get to kill people, you don't get to kidnap people. Uh, I think that the values that have developed later, anti-slavery values, for example, that are a later breaking development from Western civilization, uh, you know, that, but have roots in Judeo-Christian civilization. Uh, th those are values that that are fundamental values of decency. The the ones embodied in the in the in the Constitution seem to me to be good values. Like I don't get to har harm you because I don't get to use the government as a club against you because I disagree with what you say. I don't get to use the government as a club against you because I disagree with your religious practice that doesn't infringe on me. Uh, I have sort of a John Stuart Mill view of interpersonal decency when it comes to governmental intervention, and that is I get to wave my fist around as much as I want so long as it doesn't hit your face. And, and it's wonderful about the slippery of that, right? Because that same value between one community and one community that has been treated really unequally to be fundamental and fair. Well, give, give me an example. <laughs> so, slave, so, so, as, as, so as I say, the, the John Stuart Mill system would definitely not value slavery. I mean, that's, that's not me waving my fist around until I hit your face. That's me putting you in chains. I mean, that's, that's, not, that, that's, that's a fundamental human evil because I'm violating somebody else's rights. So it's, it's the, 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 the basic value that originally springs from the notion that we're all created in God's image and then, con and then you know, consummates in, in the idea that we're all equal under, under 
under God and that we all have equal rights under God, that doesn't, that doesn't allow things like, like slavery. And it, and, it, and, it, and it fights against things like slavery. Now, where I think that, that some people get dicey about this, I don't want to lead you here, but I think this is where some people get dicey about this idea, is they say, okay, well, what about the things where I'm waving my fist around and I'm not formally hitting you in the face, but you're, but you're getting me upset? So, for example, if you have a private business and the private business decides to discriminate against Jews, right, or decides to discriminate against blacks or against gays, right, is that, what would you do about that? So, I don't think the government has any business telling private businesses what to do because I think that capitalism is colorblind and that means that if somebody discriminates against Jews or blacks or gays, they'll go out of business. There'll be other people who offer their services. The problem is once you start to let, once you start to let government or society take a, take a forced stand and enforce stand as to what quote unquote good behavior is and bad behavior is, you start to get into real trouble, but I think we can all agree what actual harming behavior looks like. Actual harming behavior is not me denying you a service that I don't owe you in the first place. Actual harming behavior is me stealing something from you, punching you, taking your children, you know, the, the, something that you have a right to, I'm taking, I'm taking away from you. And you don't have a right to my services. No one does. So to be fair, is that something that you would define as not objective? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, so, so, so now you're getting into a broader question, which is, are any values objective or subjective? All values, I suppose, in the end, are going to be subjective, but I think the ones that we can most easily agree on, and the ones to which there's an objective standard anyway, that doesn't require you to read my mind, let's find a standard where we don't have to read each other's mind. So a standard where I don't have, it, microaggressions require me to read your mind. I have to try and figure out what's going to offend you and what's not. I don't have to read your mind to know you probably don't want me to punch you in the face. Right? Like, there's, there's an objective standard there where I don't have to read your mind. We all sort of agree. And, and if, we, if we can't agree on that, we can't agree on literally anything, and then society's over. So I guess time to, to buy your, your, food, your food parcels and, and build your bomb shelters, if that's the case. If we can't all agree it's bad to hit each other in the face, then we have no place to start. Thanks so much. All right, this will be the last question, right? <coughs> Hi. Um, so throughout your speech, uh, you kind of treat the left as sort of this monolithic group of people. Yeah, like a block, a terrible block of terrible people. <laughs> exactly. Sure. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, like at one point, for example, you said the left hate free speech. The left only care about diversity but not values. Right, it's shorthand. The, the left is trying to destroy America's value system. Um, my first question to you is, isn't this sort of kind of generalized hyperbolic language divisive and doesn't it kind of um, add to division instead of bringing America together? And my second question is, do you acknowledge that the left is composed of a wide, diverse range of people um, with, with diverse viewpoints? Of course, of course. Oh, here's, here's what I define the left as. So good question. Here's what I define the left as if the speech didn't make it clear. Excuse me. When I say that the, the fundamental left value, the, the, if, the, if you believe this, you are on the left. If you believe that fairness of outcome is more important than, fairness of right, than equality of rights, then you are on the left. That, uh, I mean, it, it depends on an issue by issue case. You may agree with the left, but I don't think that you are on the left. I mean, I, since I'm the one speaking, I get to make the definition. But you know that. But that being the case, yeah, by my definition, that's what I mean. When you're asking me what I mean when I say the left, now you're asking me to read your mind and tell you what you mean when you say the left. What I mean when I say the left is the left means people who believe equality of outcome trumps equality of opportunity. Now, if you want to say that there are people who don't believe that who are on the left, you're using another definition, not the one that I'm using, so, which is okay. I mean, okay, we can so, talk about your definition. But th by that logic, would you acknowledge that there are people who, ha who are liberals but who aren't yes, under your yes, definition? Yes, that I would acknowledge, so which you, is why I use specifically don't use the term liberals. I don't equate liberals and leftists. They're not the same. Okay. So, so, so I, think, I think there are liberals who believe what old school liberals used to believe, the whole idea, I'll, I may disagree with you, but I'll die for your right to say it. Uh -huh. But that's a liberal value. That's not a leftist value. But, th I mean, this kind of idea of your left, do, how big of a population this thing, do you think this is? Do you think that that embodies a majority of liberals? H I don't understand, like, 
I think that well, we, I think, when I, think when it, when I, I think hear it, you say left, I kind of I think it embodies like, a majority of the people who ardently believe in the Democratic Party platform, to be more specific. So you think that most people who are Democrats are no. under your definition of left? No, I think most people who deeply study and believe in the Democratic Party platform are leftists. I think most people who vote Democrat do so because they think Republicans are assholes. <laughs> I mean... It, <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, have a good night. Thanks. Thank